know if you noticed, but man, I like the paint job. Amen? Oh, it looks very nice. Very nice. So we thank the decorating committee, and I know they've put a lot of time and work into this, and there's a lot more to be done. Baseboards are going to be changed, and uh, as you heard, we're getting new carpet. And we got outside work still up to do, so I know it's a work in progress, just like God's people are a work in progress. Amen? And uh, that doesn't happen overnight, does it? So we thank you so much for your patience. We truly do. And then once Wednesday nights get fired back up, we're going to be looking at uh, the series that Adrian Rogers put together, one of the best series I've ever seen. Uh, whether you've been walking with God for 40 years, 50 years, or whether you've been walking with God for just five years, it's a great, great series. But what every Christian ought to know is what it's entitled. So I'm looking forward to that. Then after that, we're going to look at Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses. And then after that, we're going to another series on Wednesday nights. So I'm looking forward to uh, our Wednesday nights again. So hopefully that'll be soon. We'll let you guys know. But thank you so much for your patience for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to Titus. Titus chapter number 2, Titus chapter 2, and uh, God's Word has a lot to say about being a mom, amen? We praise God for our mothers. I know that sometimes Mother's Day can be very painful. My mom's in heaven. I miss her dearly. I truly do. And, uh, and I know other moms are also uh, in heaven as well. But we praise God for our moms, for all that they deposited into our life growing up. And uh, there's no such thing as a perfect mom, perfect dad, or a perfect teenager, amen, or kid. I always, I always remind teenagers and say, look, you know, we, you, you didn't get a peek of your parents, and they're like, yeah, that's right. But then we got to remind them, but hey, we also didn't get to pick our kids, amen? Amen, amen. Got to keep them humble, amen? Yes, indeed. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but, you know, my mom, uh, she was lost for biggest part of her life. She got saved when she was in her 50s, but my mom did teach me to pray, even though she was lost. She said to me on many occasions, you better pray that that stain comes out of that carpet. Amen. <laughs> boy, oh boy. I don't know about your mom, but my mom also taught me uh, time travel. She said, listen, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you in the next week. Amen. <laughs> that sound familiar to you? Boy, oh boy. She taught me irony as well. You know, she would say, hey, listen, man, you, you don't stop that crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. Amen? <laughs> boy, oh boy, she taught me uh, uh, how to uh, do contortionism. What do you mean by contortionism? She would say, look at all the dirt on the back of your neck. Amen? <laughs> boy, oh boy. Uh, she taught me wisdom. She said, when you get to my age, you'll understand. And you just kind of sit there looking at them with a blank look on your face. Until you get to their age, amen? <laughs> boy, oh boy. She taught me justice. She said, one day, by God's mercy, you'll have kids. Amen? <laughs> amen. I had one person say, now, Brother Dave, I, I hear you praying for patience. You better be careful with that because you pray for patience a whole lot. He'll give you kids sometimes. Amen? <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, anyway, we're going to find ourselves in Titus chapter number 2. And we want to begin... Uh, they're reading in verse number one of chapter two. Oh, but before we do, a great definition for grandparents. It says this, and I quote, Grandparents, the people who think your children are wonderful, even though they're sure you're not raising them right. Amen. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, my, my dad's come to me, and I'm like, Dad, man, you obviously forgot. <laughs> boy, I mean, I'm not torturing my kids. Boy, amen. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> This is God's holy and valuable word, and I just want to say from the depth of my soul, if you are a mom, man, we praise God for you. Amen. Amen. The Bible says this in chapter number two. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That word sounds where we get the word hygienic. It means clean, sound, solid, teaching. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. And then the aged women, <clears throat> likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Verse 5, to be discreet, chaste. This is what older saints, older women who have kids who are now grown out of the home, <laughs> The transition is 
Paul is instructing them to teach younger women who have children. And this is what he says that they're to teach. To be discreet, to be chaste, to be keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's consider this subject, Mother's Day. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. Lord, I just want to say thank you so much for your grace and your love, or all that you've done for us, or that you do for us on a daily basis. Lord, I just pray now that your word would be magnified, that, Lord, you would open up our hearts, our minds, our ears to truly understand your word. Lord, I just pray that you'll use your word to revive, to refresh, to convict, or just to remind us of the importance of mothers and all that they do in the home, or what your expectations of them are. And Lord, we're here to hear your word. We're not here to hear anybody else's opinion, but, but Lord, your word. And Father, I pray if there's anyone lost here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day that they would truly turn from their sin, turn from self, and Lord, turn to you, putting all their faith and trust in the fact that you died on the cross for their sins. Lord, as you tell us, the wages of sin is death and hell forever, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Give them the faith to believe that you, Jesus, were died, that you were buried, and that, Lord, you were raised from the dead. And, Lord, I give them the faith to call upon your name. And, Lord, you tell us in your word, all those that call upon your name shall be saved. So, Lord, if there's one here today that's lost that does not know you, Lord, I just pray that you remind them that eternity is forever, and they're either going to live in heaven or hell for all eternity. And, Lord, I know it's your desire that none should perish, that none should go to hell, but that all should come to repentance and put their faith and trust in your Son, Jesus Christ and the sacrificial provision that he made for them to cleanse them of all their sins so they, they can be forgiven and have heaven as their home. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there was a couple people. One of them name was Anna, and there was a guy named John Wanamaker who campaigned to establish Mother's Day as a national holiday in America. And on May 8, 1914, Congress got together, passed the law, and designated the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. <clears throat> President Woodrow Wilson announced the first National Mother's Day. In that era, it was a day for American citizens to honor those mothers whose sons had fallen in World War I. And now we know that being a mother, uh, moms are in the trenches constantly. Amen? There was a group of men who were being interviewed, and they were basically saying that their wives didn't do enough at home. And so you had a, a bunch of ladies in the congregation looking at these men, like if looks could kill, they would have been dead, amen? Well, the whole premise of the show was, was to take those men and let them stay at home, and they had to do every single thing that a mother did. And then their wives went to work uh, where they did. So they worked it out with the bosses and all that, so it was for two weeks. At the end of that two weeks, Every one of those men were crying. Every one of those men truly and humbly apologized to their wives. And they confessed how arrogant and how proud they were. And they came to realize, and it's, it's known statistically, that a woman who stays at home and raises children is, is equivalent to two full-time jobs. And everybody said amen. 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 I remember I had to watch my kids. I think my wife had to go away. Her dad was having some heart problems. I think it was like for a week or maybe 10 days. And man, I'm telling you, with all of my heart, I pray for the rapture every day. <laughs> Boy, man. Well, you have in this text of Scripture uh, seasoned saints. And then you have uh, susceptible saints. And he gives us a description of what older saints, older men, are to have in their life as God works on them, as the Holy Spirit changes them daily into the image of Christ. Also for these older women, the Word of God here in this text, the Scripture says the aged women. Now, uh, <clears throat> now this group, basically, uh, in verse 6, it says, Likewise, exhort or urge. Paul was saying to Titus, you must... Uh, strongly encourage them to rely on the Lord. You must strongly encourage them to exhibit these behaviors as they depend on the Lord. Well, <clears throat> Paul knows that, you know, young women sometimes can be over-ambitious, they can be passionate, uh, they can sometimes even become arrogant and cocky, so he wanted the older women in the church to teach younger women to establish uh, these things. Now, Titus was written to laymen and leadership. And the whole premise of this book is evangelistic. 
that the church truly is doing what God designed it to do, and that is to be the greatest outreach on this planet to see souls saved, a church that is actively engaged, intentionally wanting to see souls saved. Well, in order for that to happen, our lifestyle has to match the gospel that comes out of our lips. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so he writes this book and says, listen, this is how leadership in a church and how laymen are to work together. And these are some of the characteristics that need to be in your heart and life so that when you do share the gospel, people can't look at you and say, well, I see and hear what you're saying, but I see you living completely contrary to what this Bible says. <clears throat> so let's just put it that way uh, simply. But basically, this is the premise of the whole entire book. Now, when you look at uh, this passage of Scripture, you'll also see in it serving saints as well. Well, as, as people of God, we're to constantly and continually be serving the Lord. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you what, I need to get a drink. I apologize to you. Brother George, don't say nothing about my Diet Coke, amen? <laughs> he gives me a sermon every time he sees it. You say, well, Brother Dave, I just want to remind you how everybody else feels when you're preaching God's Word, amen? <laughs> amen, amen. <clears throat> All right, let me get back here. All right, here we go. All right, so these susceptible saints here in chapter 2, uh, speaking to the older women. Now, Paul was wise because he didn't give the age of these women. Amen? He probably paused and said, Now, Lord, do I really have to write their age? And the Lord gave them a break. Amen? <clears throat> but typically, uh, this is talking about women that are probably 55 years and older. Their kids are grown, but yet they've been seasoned. They have the experience of motherhood. And so the Lord, through Paul, tells these women that they need to teach younger women. But he tells these older women that they have to have proper-like characteristics that were to adorn their life, Christ-like characteristics. And maybe uh, one day we'll go through those. They were to have proper communication coming out of their life. You know, the Word of God says uh, to be holy in their behavior, uh, not false accusers. In other words, they're not gossips. They're not slanderers. And then they also were to have a proper self-control in their life. He says not heavy drinkers of wine. In other words, women who are not getting drunk. Women who may have lost their husbands who try to find solace in a bottle rather than going to the Lord. So he warns them of those things. But then also, they were to properly challenge others in their life by teaching uh, younger women how to raise their homes, how to be obedient to their husbands, how to raise their kids and to help them along the way, to keep them on track. And so that's what we want to look at. We want to look at what these older women in the church were to teach these younger women when it comes to this subject of, of what a mom and a home should be doing, what her home should look like. Now, the Word of God gives us a lot of information, so I'm going to try to hit the highlights as we move through this. But, you know, we live in a society today that looks down on marriage, that says it's obsolete, that says that marriage really uh, is uh, male bondage, and uh, the Apostle Paul was even accused of being a chauvinist, and all of this feminist movement have truly attacked the home and what marriage is all about. Well, the Word of God tells us in His Word that, you know, marriage was the first institution uh, in the garden, you know? There was marriage before there was kids, amen? There was marriage before anything else, so the Lord puts holiness in a premium on the home. The first home was established before any business was established. So it's one man and one woman in a covenant marriage with the Lord and through their love for one another, the fruit of that love is children. And so marriage is being attacked. Listen, the homosexual agenda today is not just wanting to attack marriage, not just wanting to redefine marriage, but listen, the ultimate goal of that agenda, Satan is the one behind all of that, wants to obliterate marriage. He wants to completely erase and define all those lines. In fact, if some of them had their way, they would say that your kids don't belong to you, but they belong to the public. They belong to the government. I'm telling you that that mindset is out there, and so it's under attack. And women working at home are uh, working in the home is also under attack. So all kinds of things are being attacked. And unfortunately, many women who are poorly taught find themselves being sucked in or pulled in by this feminist rhetoric. <clears throat> and uh, 
You know, and where did it all just start, Brother Dave? It all started in the fall, part of the curse. God told Eve a part of her punishment was, your desire is going to be for your husband. That word desire means you're going to have a desire to want to rule over your husband. You're going to have a desire to want to rule over the roost in your home. That was a part of the curse. That's why a marriage needs the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because a man's tendency is to want to bow up and to uh, unfortunately beat down uh, a woman. And so when you have two people who are lost that are out of control, that's what takes place. There's chaos in that home. Amen? But the reason why that movement that, you know, women are better than men and we can do more than men and all that kind of stuff, listen, it all comes from the curse. It all comes from the fall. So the balance in all of that is, is by seeing people get saved, first and foremost, so that their souls don't burn in hell forever. But also God brings the balance and establishes the roles of a man and a woman and children in the home. Are you with me? Yes. <clears throat> all right, so first of all, God tells these uh, seas and saints, these older women to teach younger women what, Brother Day? Well, first of all, God says they're to teach them that they're have, they're to have a sacrificial love in their sanctuary. Now, a woman's sanctuary, I'm saying that as her home. Amen? You know, it takes six months to build a house, but it takes a lifetime to build a home. Are you with me? So, a sacrificial love. Well, the sacrificial love has two areas in it. Look at verse 4. To love their husbands and to love their children. So God gives us two areas that a young woman are to have as a sacrificial love in their home. The first area is a sacrificial love for their companion, for their husband. Verse 4, to love their husbands. Now, <clears throat> Paul is not just talking about a romantic love. But he's talking about an extremely important type of love in marriage. God is talking about a sacrificial, committed, unconditional love for their husband in the home. They're to have for their husbands as a godly uh, husband chooses to have for their wives. Listen, these principles also apply to men just as much as they apply to a mom that lives in a home. And I'm not just saying that, it's true. Now look at, look at the Greek word there, love. <clears throat> Here it's, it's philanderos. And it means a determined love. But yet, it means a love that's not only determined, but it's a love that also carries with it great affection. That's not based on a husband's worthiness. It's not based on his goodness. But it's based on Christ's worthiness and God's command. It's the same love that God has for us. That's not based on merit. It's not based on worthiness. It's not based on our goodness. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God commanded his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. In the Greek, it literally means Christ died while we were in the very act of sinning against Him. He still died for us. And He loves us without merit, without condition, and without any, any goodness. Because the Bible says there's none good in His eyes. Amen? So, <clears throat> have you ever thought about how painful it was for God to love you? In, Hebrew, or in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God's commandment is to give us eternal life. And when God chose to give you eternal life, think about all the pain that His Son and that God the Father would have to go through in order to love you sufficiently and completely. So sometimes, love in the home, sacrificial love can be painful. It's a love that needs to be worked at. It's a love that you have to choose every day to say, I'm either going to let self rule and reign on the throne of my heart, or I'm going to let Christ rule and reign on the throne of my heart. God is the gentleman. He doesn't put a chain around us and force us to do those things, even though He leads us and wants to be in control of our life. Amen? So God says you're to love your husband in spite of what he does. Now listen, I'm not talking about women that are abused. You need to separate yourself from that situation. Amen? But guys, listen, we, we all know we do irritating things. Amen? Even though you may not think it's irritating, but man, when your wife is red-faced and she's looking at you, with not so much affection, you're probably doing something that's irritating. Amen? <clears throat> but, just like none of us are worthy of Christ's love and affection and mercy, the Lord says to a woman, you're to love your husband with unconditional respect. And when you can't respect your husband, then God's word says you're to respect Christ and submit to him because Christ has never hurt you. Christ has never let you down. You're to submit yourself to Christ and allow Christ to work on your husband. Now, I know there's some ladies that say, well, 
I've been waiting for him to be worked on and I just don't see it. Well, you just keep praying. Amen. 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 Now, if Jesus Christ were to love you, let me ask you a question. If Jesus Christ were to love you, ladies, just as you've been loving your husband, how would you be loved? How would you be treated if Jesus were to treat you just like you treat your husband? How would Jesus talk to you if you, uh, Jesus said, hey, I'm going to talk to you the way you talk to your husband. How would you be talked to? Man, the same thing goes for you. You know, how would, your, how would Christ love you based on how you love your wife? How would he talk to you? How would he treat you when you came to him on a daily basis? It's a good question, amen? So this is the way that the Lord says we're to love our wives and love our husbands. Man, when they're ungrateful, when they're uncaring, sometimes when they're unlovable, yet the Lord Jesus still loves us, amen? So this also applies to the wife, it applies to the husband, that we're to have an unconditional love and respect for the Lord and for each other. Amen? Amen. Now, if a wife does not truly uh, love her husband, no matter what the circumstances, she must, in obedience to the Lord, train herself to love him. Listen to what uh, first, uh, our, our, uh, first Corinthians 3, 18 says, Wives, be subject as unto the Lord. Be subject as unto the Lord. Wives, be subject to your husbands as unto the Lord. In other words, God says, listen, you're to submit to your husband and you're to respect your husband just as much as you respect Christ. You do it for Christ's sake. Why? So that the word of God is not blasphemed there according uh, to our, our, our verse that we're looking at, verse 5. So that the word of God be not blasphemed. Are you with me? There's a totally distorted picture of what love is today. Uh, man, it's love in the movies and all the romance. Man, that's just like a fire and a flash in the pan. Because you know as well as I do, after, after being married for a year, man, some of that stuff begins to wane, amen? And you realize, hey, I've got to work at this. Man, I've got a lot of selfishness in me. I've got a lot of dying to self I've got to do. And guys, listen, anytime there's a big fight in a home, I don't care if it's teenagers, if it's a, a wife or a husband, the bottom line is this. The Word of God says contentions only come because of pride. So in other words, World War III goes on in any home when somebody says, I am not going to let Christ rule and reign. I'm going to reign and let self rule and reign. So they're self-involved in some of those things. Amen? On both parts. And so we have to learn to die daily to ourselves. And the only way we can do that is by asking God to have His way and to have His will in our heart. God's always seeking to be in control of your life. All you have to do is be willing to submit to Him. <clears throat> Are you with me? So, real love consists of doing things for the other person, whether you feel like it or not. To put others' interests above your own interests. It means giving sacrificially of yourself for their sakes, not for appreciation in return or favor, or return love. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? You know, listen to what Paul said in Philippians 2, 2, 4. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Now this is for every Christian out there, but this especially applies in this context to how older women are to teach younger women to love their husbands and to love their home. Are you with me? All right. So, God is saying to young, married, susceptible saints that they're to love their husbands. It's not a good idea. It's not just good manners. To do so, that was an obligation that you have to the Lord Jesus Christ according to His Word. It's not the great suggestion, it's the great command of God. Amen? So, not loving them in this way is sin before God because God says, listen, because of your love for Christ, you have to love them not based on their merit, not based on their worthiness, not based on what you think is worthy or not worthy, but based on God's Word. And that's an unconditional love and respect for your husband. That's what God's Word says. Now, <clears throat> let's move on and let's look at uh, what else she's to love in her home. 
Well, the Word of God says, who else is she to love sacrificially? Not only their companions, but also they're to sacrificially love their children. According to this passage of Scripture, look at verse 4, to love their husbands, to love their children. Now, the older are to teach their younger uh, women how to do this very thing, how to love their kids. Because listen, <coughs> I've heard some people say the greatest calling of a woman is motherhood, but that's not true. Because a mom can't be a mom unless she has a what? A husband. Amen? Her first priority is the Lord Jesus, according to Ephesians and Colossians. Her second priority is to her husband. Her third priority is her children. Now the world gets that backwards. See, sometimes, I knew a missionary, man, God greatly used mightily this missionary family, but he unfortunately allowed ministry to become his mistress, and he put ministry and the people of, of that place first, and he began to neglect his wife. Well, her wife began to not get herself word from him anymore, which that's where it should be, first Christ, then her husband should be encouraging her, nurturing her, all those things, well, he wasn't doing it, and so she got herself word from her kids. And so she invested all those years into her kids. And when her kids left home, when they left home, she was looking at a complete stranger who she no longer said, I'm not in love with anymore. And she did the wrong thing. And she left him and divorced him. Boy. So a woman's highest calling is first and foremost to be saved. To love the Lord Jesus with all her heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen. But her second highest calling is to be the helpmate that that God created her for to help that man be all that he can be. To establish that home. To make it godly. To make it the best they possibly can. So, a woman's highest calling is not motherhood. It's not. I know that flies against contemporary teaching today, but uh, you've got to be true to the Word of God. Amen? But nevertheless, man, the calling to be a mom is certainly a high one, if not higher than even the President of the United States. I would even say that it probably goes past that. Amen? Because listen, when a child is brought into this world, as I was told by one preacher, he said, Dave, listen, people are in love with the idea of having kids. Now, you know as well as I do, if you had kids, being in love with the idea and having them are two different things. Amen? <laughs> boy, oh boy. But he said this, and I'll never forget. He said, now Dave, don't ever forget that when you bring a child into this world, you are bringing an eternal soul into this world that's either going to live in heaven forever or hell forever. And I remember that was so profound to me. I many, many, many times uh, got into my prayer closet. And I kept this from my wife at the time, but I begged God. I said, Lord, please do not give me children. Don't let us have children. Keep her womb shut. If all they're going to do is grow up and be successful as far as the world's concerned, but yet they fail the eternal life test fail this life and fail eternity and go to hell. Lord, I would rather be childless than for my child to grow up and blame me, blame my wife if I blow it or she blows it, to use our life as an excuse for not getting saved. Boy. Children in the home are to be loved like a husband is to love his wife. The Bible says to a husband, you're to love your wife like Christ loved the church. You're to die to self every single day. Do we always do that? No, we don't. But that's nevertheless doesn't weaken God's command for our heart and our life. So in other words, God says to a woman who's raising children, you're to show no favoritism. Man, your love for your children ought to be the same. Amen? Even though God gives you maybe a night and day child, my children are night and day. Boy, I mean, they're complete opposite. It's amazing how you can get two opposites from uh, one set of parents. Amen? Boy. Because the reality is this, listen, a wife, a, a, a woman can be a great wife, but a, but a poor mom. Or a, 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 a wife can be a, a, great, a great mom to her children, but be a poor wife. God wants us to have the balance. And this is what he's telling these aged women who have been seasoned in life to teach these younger women because God wants us to have the balance. God is the one that brings balance. Amen? To our heart and life. So listen, favoritism, man, it's sinful, it's hurtful, it's destructive. You remember uh, Jacob and Joseph and his brothers gave him that coat of many colors and all it did was create strife to the point where they wanted to kill him, murder him, 
And then by the grace of God, one of the brothers stood up and said, no, we're not doing that. So they threw him into a pit and he was sold into Egypt as a slave because of favoritism. Guys, listen, you may have one child that's more obedient than the other. And when your child's obedient, it's easy to love a child that's obedient, amen? But it's difficult to love one that's disobedient. It is. But nevertheless, your love has to be unconditional for your kids. The love for your children is not an option. It's an obligation from the Lord. It's to be selfless. It's to be a sacrificial love. It's not to be a love that's based on the child's, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, looks or physical attraction. It's not to be a love that's based on intelligence or, or personality. But it's to be a love for them because you love Christ. And Christ loves your children unconditionally. Amen? They're a gift to us. They don't, we don't own them. God does. By right of creation. And by one day, by the grace of God, they repent and give their hearts to Christ. He owns them by right of regeneration as well. Amen? And redemption. By seeing them saved. Now, I tell you what. If love was based on attractiveness, I saw a picture of me when I was a baby. I was like, boy, I tell you what, Mom and Dad, I feel bad for you because all your friends lied to you, son. <laughs> you know, baby, like, <clears throat> and you know that baby's ugly too, amen? <laughs> well, if you ever hear, well, God bless you, congratulations, and you're in trouble, amen? <laughs> boy, oh boy, son. <clears throat> the most important way a mom or dad can love their child is to lead that child to a saving knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not just saying the gospel, but doing all that you can to live the gospel. It means having a home where a mom and a dad can be honest with their children and say, you know what, I got angry, I spanked you out of anger, or I blew it, I messed up, I didn't act appropriately. Uh, what you saw wasn't Christ ruling my heart, it was myself ruling my heart. You know, the greatest thing you can ever desire for your kids is for them to be like Christ, not you, but Christ, Amen. So I tell my kids, listen, don't use me as an excuse because, man, you're looking at an imperfect man that's not always filled or always controlled by the Spirit of God like I want to be. If I had one wish, I would wish this, that I would never sin against Christ ever again starting right now. That would be my wish. But the reality is we live in this, this, unfallen, unrege or this fallen, unregenerate flesh that is the anchor to our soul. That's why we have to live in the Spirit. We have to walk by the Spirit. Because we can't live the Christian life without Christ living his life in and through us. Amen? But it's easy to preach that. It's easy to have that in your head. But boy, I tell you what, sometimes there's a struggle to put Christ on the throne of your heart. Hmm. God in this text is explicitly talking to young mothers. Young mothers are to love their children socially, practically. Uh, make sure that they're physically and well-nourished and taken care of, morally and spiritually. With that kind of love... <clears throat> It has no conditions. It has no limits. They're going to love their children in spite of what they do, in spite of who they are. Amen? Now, there's consequences that come when children are disobedient. Absolutely. But you know what? I noticed that in Florida, there's actually a law. There's a law in Florida that, that, that says that parents have to take care of their children, have to clothe them and feed them. Did you know that was a law in Florida? Now, how many of you wake up and say, gosh, man, the Florida law says i got to feed them. <laughs> now, the Florida law says i got to, okay, i got to put some clothes on them, all right. I guess I'll have to do it. God forbid, amen? Boy, God forbid. So the Bible teaches us that they're to have a sacrificial love for their companion and for their children. What else are older women in the church supposed to teach younger women? Well, number two. They're to teach them not only sacrificial love for their sanctuary, but also to safeguard their sanctuary. They're to teach them to safeguard their sanctuary. Look at verse 5. It says to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, or workers at home and good. Now these verses that we just read, God gives to us three ways a young married woman is to safeguard her sanctuary or her home. Now, men are the protectors, the providers, but women are that awesome glue that just holds everything together. Amen? Now, the first way that these young, susceptible saints are to safeguard their sanctuary as they're being taught by the older is, first of all, they're to teach these younger women to establish biblical sensibility in their home. Younger women who have children are to establish biblical sensibility in their home. 
What do you mean by that? Look at verse 5. It says to be discreet. Now that word discreet in the Greek means to be sensible. To use good judgment concerning ethical, moral, spiritual, emotional, physical matters. To resist worldly attraction. To resist worldly temptation that can overtake women. It means to know the difference between what is harmful in my house and what is truly helpful to my kids and to my husband in my house. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter, uh, Proverbs 31, she looks well to the ways of her household. So she's to be with it. She's to be sober-minded. She's to be on alert. She is to safeguard her sanctuary by exercising biblical sensibility. How do we know what's right and wrong? A woman who knows the Word of God. Amen? This is how all of us, even preachers, know the difference between what is evil and what is good. What is acceptable and what is not acceptable to the Lord. But number two, not only exercising biblical sensibility, but also uh, exercising moral control. She said exercise moral control. Look at verse 5. To be chaste. Now that word chaste means to be pure. The Greek word is hagnos, and it refers to moral purity, and it even goes into the, to the point where it's talking about sexual purity. She's to be faithful to her husband, just as a husband is to be faithful to her wife, to his wife. So young women who are susceptible saints have moral control over their passions in general. And they're also to have control over their sexual passions as well. Your husband uh, may never compliment you. Your husband uh, doesn't treat you the way that you need to be treated. Man, your husband doesn't buy you flowers. He doesn't meet your love language requirements, which are gifts, which are affirmation, which are uh, compliments, which are spending time with you, which are acts of service. Those things, let's say your husband fails in all those things. Well, I'm telling you right now, Satan comes along and says, Hey, man... He's not doing it. Maybe there's somebody at your work that gives you a compliment and says, Boy, you look good. What? Well, they begin to smell that perfume. But if they're not careful, they'll begin to drink that perfume as well. And listen, it's okay to smell perfume, but if you've ever had it in your mouth, it's not good for you. Amen? Amen. And neither is that at all. And so sometimes temptation can come. It can come to a husband. It can come to a wife the same way. You know, dressing in a way that doesn't make men lust after you. It draws attention to that aspect of the life rather than drawing aspect to your personality. You know, dressing in a way that brings out your characteristics, Christ characteristics, not fleshly sinful ones. <clears throat> you know, I tell single ladies all the time, what you catch a man with, you're going to have to keep him with. So if you're catching that man with your looks, well, man, that's a flash in the pan. You could be in an accident tomorrow and have a scar be across your face. Then what? You see, you have to catch a man with your godliness, with Christ in you. Amen? Because a godly woman will attract another godly woman. Amen? Boy, they will. But at the same time, men are driven by sight. They are. Man, the uh, pornography industry... Man, is driven by men. It's not driven by women. It's driven by men. That's just the reality of life. Let me ask you this, you know, or let me just say, what you, what you wear says a lot about what you think about the Lord and what you think about your home and what you think about your husband. It's true. Guys, I'm not trying to be difficult. Well, I don't think so, Brother Dave. Or let me ask you this. How can you tell a woman is a prostitute? By her personality or by how she dresses? Be honest now. By what? By how she dresses. Amen. <laughs> You go to your job interview and boy, they're in those short, short skirts and all of those things. And man, guys, listen. Man, when you get attention, trust me, the devil will give you all the attention you want, but it's going to be the wrong attention. Amen? And the Bible says that a person that commits adultery lacks major integrity. Man, they get wrapped up in that. The Bible says that a wound and this honor you will get and your reproach will never be wiped away. Listen, we understand the steps of adultery. We understand why people get tempted into that because there's hurt, there's neglect, there's all those things going on and then people, if we're not careful, can be sucked down the path of adultery. But at the end of the line, no matter what took place, no matter what neglect was there, the bottom line is God says it's still sin and you're responsible for it. Right. 
You know, what, what do kids do when their brother or sister uh, does something to them? What do they do? They run to who? Mom or dad. And what do they do? They tell them, amen? Listen, if your husband or your wife are not doing those things, go in your prayer closet and tell on them to Jesus. And let Jesus get a hold of their heart and their life, amen? Hmm. It means a woman is not flirty with her eyes. She uh, is not flirty with her words or her gestures. It means that she exercises and establishes this biblical sensibility. She has moral control. Her eyes are only for her husband. And a man should only have eyes for his wife. Amen? But listen, immorality will devastate and destroy a family. Do you realize that when the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery, that it's literally covering every sexual sin out of the covenant marriage of one man and one woman with the Lord? That's what the Bible says in Hebrews. Hey, the marriage bed is undefiled in the sight of God. But the fornicator and the adulterer, God will judge. So any type of sexual activity outside of one man, one woman, and a covenant marriage, Married according to the laws of the country they live in, because we also have to, we have to obey man's laws if they don't go against Scripture, as it tells us in Romans and also in other parts of the Bible. Anything outside of that is sin. And it will destroy your home. It will destroy your family. It will. But guys, also the Word of God says that she also has to exhibit and exercise concern for her house. Concern for her house. Look at verse 5, it says to be homemakers, workers in the home. Now, it's very difficult for many contemporary wives to be fulfilled by just being a homemaker today. There's several reasons for that. Why? Because the cost of living is very high. Do you realize that, that, that on average it costs $35,000 per child to raise one? That's counting their school, their clothes, their food, their medical, and, and many other things that come along with, with kids. $35,000 in our society today to raise one kid. Uh, modern appliances, other conveniences are greatly reduced and make simple housework. You know, what took maybe four or five hours may can take a half hour today. So there's a lot of free time uh, that goes on now because of our conveniences. And our culture tells women that there's, if they stay at home, that that's bondage, that, that's male chauvinism. And guys, the Word of God doesn't teach that. You know, women... Their first priority is their home. Their first priority is their husband and their children. But there's some women that have to work. Then their husband got in trouble with the prison. Uh, then the cost of living today is through the roof. So sometimes a woman has to do that. But what God is saying is, listen, it's not so much that a woman's place is in the home as what he's saying is it's your responsibility there. That's always to be your priority. You're to always be working at that harder than you work at anything else in your life based on the circumstances you may find yourself in. Are you with me? A home, as I've learned, and I'm still learning, is an extension of your wife. It's an extension of a woman. Why? Because it's a place where she can offer her best encouragement. And it's a place where hospitality can be shown. It's a place where she can truly support her children, support her husband the way the Lord would have her to, to show genuine love for her kids, to raise them and not let the church raise them to teach them the principles of God's word as that husband also should be doing the same thing. Are you with me? To live Christ and his example in front of them. The home. You know, my wife says, you know, Dave, if, if there's, there's dirty dishes in the sink or this is out of place, that's out of place, she feels shuffled. She feels this shuffle. She can't sleep. She can't rest until those things are in proper order. It's an extension, a reflection of who they are. And I kind of mess that up sometimes. Amen? Boy, oh boy. Yeah, don't give me all pious, you man. I, man, I know you're guilty too. Amen? Amen. Boy, oh boy. <clears throat> Look at verse 5. It says to be good. That word translated in good means to be kind. God says that a young woman who's married needs to be seasoned and tempered with kindness, with gentleness. Uh, to be considerate, to be sympathetic, even to those who don't deserve it in her house. That's what God's Word says. According to that word, to be good, to be kind, to show that Jesus himself said that God, was un that God is kind to ungrateful and evil men. He's still kind to them, just as he was kind to you when you were lost. Amen? 
The true victims are those women who want to live independent of God and His Word. God's blessing is on a woman who wants to follow His ways and follow His plan according to the Word of God. Now let me just quickly say this and I'm done. You're to teach young women who are married, who have children, to have a sacrificial love in her sanctuary for her husband and for her kids. To safeguard her sanctuary. But number three, to be submissive in her sanctuary. Now, boy, there's a word that a lot of people don't like to hear that kind of runs against the great in the grain of this world. In fact, the world is so crept into the church that sometimes when women in church hear that, boy, they don't like the word to be submissive, especially to their husband. But guys, what does God's word say? Who's the author of life? Amen? Verse 5, to be obedient to their own Husbands, hey, listen, if we don't like the meal, hey, I'm just a waiter boy, amen? I'm just a servant hot to you, but if you don't like don't like the meal, go to the one who cooked up the Bible, amen? Because he's the one who said it, to be obedient to their own husbands. Men, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, they are to be subject to their own husbands as to the Lord, as the husband, or, or, as, as the husband is head of the wife, Christ is also head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. And just as the church is subject to Christ, also wives ought to be subject to their own husbands in everything. Wow. That's a big word. Submit. You know what submit really means in the Greek? I'll tell you what it means, lady. It means duck. <laughs> so God can hit your husband upside the head when he does wrong. Amen? Listen, God's very crystal clear when it comes to a man leaving his home. God says, yes, on Judgment Day, I'm holding you responsible. And you have 51% of the stock. I've, I've made it that way. And you're going to give an account of yourself. You're going to give an account of your wife. You're going to give an account of your kids. And if you're a pastor, you're going to also give an account of how you pastored the church. So we have a different line that we have to stand in, guys. Amen? And God says, listen, I'm holding you responsible. So, you know, listen, I can give my 10-year-old the keys to the car and say, drive yourself to school. I can do that. But I'm going to bear the responsibility and the weight of the consequences of that too. Amen? There's a lot of men who need to pull up their boots by their bootstraps and be the men that God's called them to be in the home. Listen, if you want to rule the roost as a woman, you are out of the will of God. God didn't design that. Listen, the word submissive has nothing to do with acquire, has nothing to do with, with uh how, how, how much better you are it has nothing to do with ability. It has everything to do with the role that God's called us to. Listen, a man doesn't have the ability to have a, have a baby, amen? But women do. So he's not talking about ability. It's not talking about equality. Because listen, man, we're all the same. We're all saved the same way in the eyes of God. We're all equal in the eyes of God, amen? Listen, it was the Lord that propped up women. It was the Lord that gave great honor to, one, to a woman. It was the Lord Himself that did that. I mean, the very first person that was able to see Christ resurrected was a what? A woman. Amen? The very first one to share the gospel was a woman. I mean, God gives great honor to women. He does. So being submissive is a military term. It means to line up under authority. You see, when kids rule the house, there's what? Chaos. Amen? If a woman rules the house, there's chaos because God is not going to bless that the way he wants it to be blessed. It's God, husband, wife, children. That's how it works according to the scripture. Those are the priorities that God has set forth for us in the Colossians and also Ephesians on how to run our home. Listen, I'll prove it to you. Jesus Christ humbled himself, even though he existed as God, he humbled himself, went into the womb of the Virgin Mary, had perfect humanity wrapped around him, and was born into this world. And the Bible says that he was subject, he was submissive to God the Father as a man. And just because he was submissive to God the Father, it didn't make him any less God. It didn't take away his equality with God or him being God. So being submissive has nothing to do with equality, has nothing to do with ability. And the Bible says that men are to be pastors, not women. The Bible says that one of the requirements to be a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. Now, a woman can't be a husband, amen? amen? According to the scripture. Is that based on ability or quality? No. It's based on the role that God established. 
Listen, there's some women that can preach ten times better than men. I've heard them. So it has nothing to do with ability. It has everything to do with the role that God wants people in. Have you ever noticed in the Garden of Eden that it was the devil that, that duped Eve, deceived Eve? But yet the Bible says that sin was passed through Adam and not Eve because she was deceived, but Adam heard God directly speak to his ear, God's mouth to his ear. God said, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but you can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. So God directly spoke to Adam. He didn't directly speak that to Eve. It was Adam that taught his wife that. And so Satan went to Eve, and she got confused. She should have said, you know what? I wasn't there on the day that God told Adam what the rules was in the garden. So let's go ask him. She didn't do that. Then she said, you can't eat it, nor can you touch it. She added to God's word. So man, the devil's got her confused. And did you notice? God said to Adam, you're responsible for the fall of mankind. Not her, but you. You directly knew. It was your job to teach your wife. It was your job to protect your wife. It was your job to keep all that in control. Are you with me? And I'll prove it even further. It says that when she ate, she gave to her husband, and then he ate, and then that is what the Bible says. Read it for yourself. It says, then both of their eyes were opened. Her eyes weren't open until he ate. Why? Because God's saying, Adam, I'm holding you responsible for how you run your house. Verse 5, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. It carries the idea of not only pointing out the evil things we say or do, but it also talks about the good things that we fail to say or do that will dishonor God and His church in the home. Now listen, the world of law, the lost judge our faith in our Lord by how we live and what we say. Amen? Do they not judge us that way? I mean, the judge uh, of transforming power of the gospel, how do they do it? They judge it by our character, do they not? Well, we hear about the change that Christ makes. We hear how the Lord, when He saves somebody, He changes that soul. Well, how do they judge that? They judge that based on your character and what they see coming from your life. Amen? The German philosopher said this, Show me your redeemed life and I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. Wow. Spurgeon put it this way. Charles Spurgeon, and I'm done. She delights in her husband, in, her per, in his person, his character, his affection to her. He is not only the chief and foremost of mankind in her eyes, he is all in all. Her heart, love, belongs to him and to him only. He is her little world, her paradise, her choice treasure. She is glad to sink her individuality in him. She seeks no renown for herself. His honor is reflected upon by her, and she rejoices in it. She will defend his name with her dying breath. Safe enough is he where she can speak for him. His smiling gratitude is all the reward she seeks. Even in her dress she thinks of him and considers nothing beautiful which is distasteful to him. He has many objects in life and some of which she does not quite understand or may even disagree with. She can do all that she can to promote them. She delights to perform such a wife, a true spouse, a realizes that the model marriage relation has set forth what our oneness with the Lord ought to be. She loves him because she loves the Lord. Mm. And that goes for husbands too. Amen? Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As the piano begins to softly play during this time of invitation, I want to ask you, do you know that you know for sure that you have a personal, real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you saved? Do you have biblical confidence that the Lord himself has written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Has there been a time in your life where you truly repented of your sin? You realized that you were a sinner, that you were guilty, that you couldn't save yourself? The Bible says that you're saved by grace and faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of human works. You're saved by His mercy and grace alone. You're saved by putting all of your confidence in Christ, His finished work on the cross, where He said, the sin debt is paid in full to tell us that. Believing in your heart that He died, believing in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, and that you truly have called upon Him to save you and to forgive you. Has there been a time in your life where you have truly have done that and you have Bible 
a confidence that you're saved. The Bible says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you have that confidence? Eternity is too long for you to be wrong. He's given us a no-so salvation. Not a hope so, I think so, it could be so. No, he's given a no-so. These things I've written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. Jesus said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. So with no one looking around, if you know that you're lost, that you need to be saved today, God's convicted you of sin, He's shown you that you're a sinner and that you're guilty and you're condemned and you're on your way to hell and want to be saved. I want you to say, Brother Dave, that's me. Raise your hand. Say, Brother Dave, I need to be saved today. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you and pray for you. Brother Dave, that's me. I want to be saved today. All right, church. Husbands, we should be the first ones at the altar. If you haven't complimented your wife, you haven't loved on your wife, haven't told her lately how much you appreciate her, in spite of, in spite of the things that go on, in spite of the things that, that irritate, in spite of the arguments and those things, we reap what we sow. If you're never showing a compliment, you're not showing affection, you're not showing validation, you're not sowing time spent and those things, then we can't expect those things back. We have to be the leader. We have to be the one that do those things first. So where's your relationship with your wife? Wife, where's your relationship with your husband? Are you encouraging? Are you uplifting? Is your home a place of peace? Is your home a place of solace? Is your home a place where your children and your husband can come home and and just see it as a, a pillow that they can lay their head on? Is it a place of comfort? Is it, is it a place where there's a godly atmosphere being displayed and shown? And if it's not, then confess that to the Lord and ask God to help you today. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. So if you'll stand at your feet, these altars are going to be open. We'll not delay. These altars will be open. If you need to come and pray, and come and pray. Nobody needs to know what you're praying about. If you have loved ones that are lost, you can come pray for them as well. But whatever God's spoken to your heart today, I want you to just take it to the Lord. And we just want to say, Lord, thank you so much for our moms. Thank you so much, Lord, for all that they do for us on a daily basis. Or they are worthy of honor. Or they are worthy of, of, of so many things. Or they're worthy of our gratitude. Lord, help us to truly have grateful hearts. Lord, help us to truly have the heart that honors them and lifts them up to the place where they need to be lifted up. So without further ado, come. These altars are open, come. Maybe you've been thinking about joining this church and you want God to use your gifts right here at Friendship Baptist Church, come and let us know. We'll talk with you about how to join our church. It's very simple and easy. So if everyone would stand to their feet, come. Stand to your feet and come.
Brother Ivan, will you close us in prayer, brother?